but there is this larger group of 10 or 12 girls, mostly 18, 19, 20, who are kind of the key accusers. And there's some interesting features about them. Some of, a lot of them are war refugees. There was a major war going on up here where I live in Maine between the Native Americans uh, and their French allies and the English. And um, there'd been a lot of people displaced by the war. There was a panic and fear that the whole, all of New England was going to be destroyed. Many of these girls were, 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 were orphans or had lost a father fighting. Um, were now lowly household servants working for masters. Um, so they left tough lives. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the men they accused, their masters that they accused of being, of being witches, they accused the master specter of beating them. Mm. Uh, Giles, Giles Corey uh, and George Jacobs, men like this who are you know, kind of middle-class kind of guys, farmers, um, and uh, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll say, well, his, his specter took his cane and beat me repeatedly, right? And I, again, I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility that some of these girls were suffering emotional, verbal, maybe physical abuse from their masters. And this was perhaps the only tool that they had to try to you know, protect themselves and get, and get back at them. How did you originally even get interested in this? Because it seems like it's a very specific interest. Well, it, so this is my area in history is 17th century New England. And to me, it's ultimately fascinating because it's like natives and newcomers. It's the time when kind of America as we think of it is created, right? And all these different people coming together. And this is like the most important, one of the most important events in the 17th century. And what do you know? I ended up teaching at Salem State University, so. What are the forces that are at play before 1692? You know, what's, what's happening in New England before we get to this period? Sure. Well, I mean, as far as European, we'll start with European settlement, but I always like to point out that, you know, the native, native people have, have, have lived in New England since, as they would say, since time immemorial, as archaeologists would say, at least 10 or 12,000 years. So, as we say here in Maine, a wicked long time, right? Um, but, but uh, so, I, you know, I want to state that first, but obviously, you know, we're really sort of interested in that story of, of cultural encounter of Europeans and Native Americans. And in New England, particularly in Massachusetts, in large part, that's a story not unique to, but certainly focused on the Puritans, right? So the arrival uh, you know, of, of, of uh, first the, the pilgrims down in Plymouth Colony in the 1620, and then the settlers of Massachusetts Bay who were Puritans in, in late 1620s, early 1630s, with bringing with them their very distinct brand of Puritanism, which um, frankly is not unrelated to the story of wish trials because it seems to be something uh, that, um, witchcraft is universal, okay? Every, Every culture, every religion throughout history will have its own version of witchcraft and witch trials. Uh, you know, frankly, one person's uh, cult is another person's faith. But having said that, uh, Puritan Massachusetts, Puritan New England is that, is that driving force that sort of organizes Massachusetts and New England and is a central part of the story of the witch trials too. Does, does Nathaniel Hawthorne sort of catch the the flavor of this, especially in those early stories about being out in the woods and how people are by themselves, you know, when there's the people in the village and then there's the people in the woods at night, you know, that duality. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I never, even though I grew up in New England, I'd never read Hawthorne until I started studying this stuff. And when I did, I said, wow, he was really, you know, he got it. And I think that's to me is part of the story is that New Englanders in the, it, it never forgot Salem and always kind of knew this story. And while Hawthorne was certainly haunted by it, um, he, he got most of it right, right? And, and, and people, people understood the story as he presented it. And it is, it is about that, 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 that sort of duality, right? That, that errand in the wilderness, as, as some people have called it. You know, we, we um, uh, these women, you know, these unfortunate women, you know, this carnival-like atmosphere, you know, what, what forces come together in 1692 that, that create this, this terrible, terrible feeling? Well, first off, just back up briefly and sort of point out that I think we seem to think that Salem is like unique. And in fact, it's not. It's, 
is coming in towards the end of a process that's been going on in Europe and eventually her colonies for about 300 years and would last really from the 1400s in some parts of Europe, even till almost the, American, the time of the American Revolution, right? And in that time period, about 100,000 people are accused of witchcraft and about half of them, unfortunately, are executed for that. Um, so, and, and frankly, by European standards, Salem is a, is a blip. Um, 15, uh, I mean, excuse me, 19 people executed, one pressed to death, five die in prison. But in outbreaks in Europe, uh, the biggest outbreak in Germany in the 1620s that lasted a decade, over 2,000 people died. So, so th this is to say that Salem is part of a much kind of larger picture of, of, of first persecution and scapegoating. Um, but there are unique factors in Salem. And even in Salem, there, have been about a, there were about 100 witches, people accused of witchcraft in New England before Salem, OK? Um, so having said that, uh, well, OK, I cheap plug here. I call my book A Storm of Witchcraft because mm -hmm. I really kind of equate it to the perfect storm, uh, the, the, more fam the famous perfect storm of, of more recent memory when it attacked the Essex County fishing fleet. And, and the point is, with any sort of perfect storm, it takes lots of bad things, a confluence of many different forces and things to come together to, to create a really horrible event. And, you know, in most outbreaks of witchcraft in New England, maybe one, maybe two people are accused. Maybe every once in a while someone gets executed. In other cases, they're, they're, they're let off the hook. But in this, to have something this big, um, really had to have a lot of bad things coming together. And I can, I, can, I can talk about some of those forces if you want. For the audience, just not everyone has the context. Can you explain kind of what was going on, what the women were doing, right? And, sure. and then what resulted and, and sort of what, as Jesse was saying, what is that atmosphere that is the other, the outsider? Right. It's really important for people to understand, particularly if there's relevance today. So I mean, did, it, were, did did what was the moment as carnival like as we we look at it now? Was it you know because it's certainly we we have the um, you know a certain theatrical quality to it in our imagination now. But was it what what, what was the during the time? What was it like? So I I think the problem is Hollywood has had its way with it to some degrees, and we kind of laugh about you know. You can't do anything on the Salem witch trials, and you have a bunch of afflicted girls writhing and screaming and shrieking. So I think there's a little uh, excess drama in most of our senses of it. But but make no mistake about it, this was this was a, a, a horrible event where you had the whole region, uh, frankly, terrified as to what might happen next. Because honest, the bottom line was, people people were becoming afflicted, people were being executed, and you never knew if you. If it if you might not be the next the next person right but anyhow but I'm, we're getting maybe we're getting ahead there maybe back up there and 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 talk about this because what what happened is in in Massachusetts in 1692 again we have like over 170 people accused of witchcraft and um, now and, is there one person that leads the charge on all that and you know it gets upside down and it gets crazy like what what like what like when it's just starting the embers of it you know take me through how it really becomes, you know, take us through it. Sure. Well, it starts off like most of these things do. It's small with the, uh, in, in January 1692, uh, the, the, the daughter of the local minister in Salem Village, Samuel Paris, and, uh, and his niece who also lives with him, these are girls that are like 10 and 12, start having strange symptoms. Um, and they had doctors in town um, who were knew, knew the business as best they could by the day. And they went through the usual list of, of what was causing the illness. And in the end, after about a month or so of studying, they determined these girls are afflicted. What, what the symptoms, uh, the symptoms of, 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 of being bewitched or afflicted in this case are, um, you know, having sort of sudden attacks of pins and needles, making you feel like someone trying to choke you or stab you. Um, and you sort of, or maybe you, you, are, you lose your hearing or your ability to speak, um, sort, of, sort of hysterical blindness, things like this. Um, and, and you know, having violent fits, right? Um, and unexplainable, they seem to come and go. And over time, this grows and it begins to afflict more and more people, particularly mostly younger and teenage women, uh, but also other people and also other forms of things going wrong. Witchcraft can take many forms. And again, from Salem, we have the sense of it being this what we what is called spectral attack, what I've just sort of described in part, right? Um, 
but it's but it's more than that. Witches were were known, you know, witches are in league with Satan, and they use his terrible powers to harm people, to kill people, to have lightning strike their house and destroy it, to have storms sink sink their ships at sea, to cause their cows to dry up and no longer produce milk, which is a life threatening matter if you're a, a farmer in the, in New England. So there's a range of harms that witches could do. But in 1692. Um, the particular affliction is what we call spectral affliction, right? And now in spectral affliction, a witch gets their power from Satan. And again, in the 17th century, this is all real. It's in the Bible. There's no doubt that this is real. Popes, priests, kings, everybody believes it. But they, they use that witch, the witch uses that power to create a specter or what we might consider to be a ghost or a spirit. Uh, invisible to anybody except the person who's being harmed and will hurt that person. Again, choking, strangling, sticking pins into them, any kinds of horrible sorts of things, right? Um, that's a spectral attack, and that's particularly common in Salem. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, gosh, that sounds kind of crazy. Who would believe that? You know, because if I'm going, <laughs> what's the matter, Dad? Where? They're choking me. Who? No one's there, right? right? And in, in the 17th century in Salem, they had the same kind of questions too, but not for reasons that we would think. Because here's the here's the deal. E again, everyone knew that witches were real and that witches could produce specters which could harm. But there was a big legal debate over that because the question was, whose specter was it, right? And some people said, you know what? Only the spirit of someone who is corrupted, someone who's in league with Satan can have their spirit used. But other people said, no, 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 no. Remember, Satan is the great trickster and he can make it look like it's someone else. I'm going, oh, 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 Jesse, stop. Oh, oh, oh. And we all know it really wasn't Jesse, it was Priscilla. And she was getting a two for here because she was choking me, but she was also making it look like Jesse was a witch. So he was in trouble too. So this was the big debate. And so spectral evidence was always a little bit suspect. Now, now is that, uh, it, when we look back on it now, like what would you, how would you, what would you say that is? Is it hysterical, you know, mass hysteria that we all believe we, together? We don't, we don't really try to use the term mass hysteria because that is a, a gendered term because of course, Hysteria, it really is derives from the Greek word for uterus. And with something, you know, the idea was that only women could be hysterical, which is crazy. Um, but what, what it, today, it's, uh, it is a, um, a, a clinical diagnosis. Here's the deal. Again, a storm of witchcraft, because there's no single explanation. And if you look at the symptoms and what was taking place, uh, no, no, no one thing describes it all. And in fact, it's really clear that some of the victims were faking, right? Uh, for, for, for various reasons. But I, but I think by and large, there are a couple of explanations. And the, the key one is, frankly, what, again, what you would call hysteria, which is, 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 is now called conversion disorder, uh, which is a kind of a controversial psychological diagnosis. And, and frankly, it's hard enough today if you're a, a clinician trying to, to diagnose it. So you know, there's some risk there in trying to do that with people who've been dead for 300 years. But um, it, conversion disorder, people convert their mental anguish into physical symptoms. And this is not faking, right? This is not like you have any control over it at all. As a matter of fact, quite the contrary. Um, but what happens is imagine these little girls, 10 and 12, and there are all kinds of problems in Salem Village. Their father has essentially been fired from his job. They've stopped paying him. They've cut off his supply of wood, which believe me on a cold New England winter, is a dangerous thing. He refuses Priscilla to knows that. And instead he's he's pacing around the parsonage, writing his sermons for the sun, for Sunday, and he's talk, he's he's taking some of the most martial and warlike verses from the Bible, like, thou shalt take thine enemies and make them thy joint stool. Um, and, and sort of he's convinced that Satan is in Salem Village and he must root him out and end it. And he's terrifying his daughter and his niece to death without even trying. And they internalize this, they hear what he's up to, and they start to have such anguish that it gets converted without their knowledge into symptoms, right? All of a sudden they start barking like a dog and screaming and writhing. 
and they're terrified because they don't know why they're doing it because they're not faking, but their minds have taken over, right? That's, and, and pretty soon, by power of suggestion, other girls in the neighborhood have the same symptoms. And that's why it's called mass conversion disorder. It really influences. Now, here's the cool thing. In, there have been cases of it more recently. And matter of fact, a few years ago, you may have read about a case of this very famous one in Leroy, New York, where yeah. a group of, of 20 or 30 people suffered from it. And interesting, mass conversion disorder is, is it tends to be a sort of a teenage affliction, uh, tends to be mostly girls. And again, if you think of the stresses that, that Puritan society, or in fact, our society, place on, on, on young girls, the, 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 the body imagery, uh, and particularly in, in, in Puritan society, in a 17th century repressive patriarchal society, we put a heck of a lot. And this is saying this is a proud father of, of two daughters who, who've made it into adulthood and are making their way in life, right? But my God, the first time I saw Barbie, Barbie doll, I'm going like, what on earth are we, what sort of images are we putting our kids? Well, anyhow, mass conversion disorder, sort of a kind of a teenage affliction amongst girls. And an interesting thing too, where does it start in, a, in Leroy and in other towns? It starts with the leaders uh, in, in Leroy. Who are, the, who are the leaders in the local high school of the, amongst the girls? The cheerleaders. And then it goes down and out through society. Mm. In Salem Village, who are the most important children in the village? The daughter of the minister, right? So, so once the leaders in the community get this, it grows. And, and again, people aren't faking. It's, it's legitimate to them. and No one can seem to explain it. And that makes it worse because it's based on fear and uncertainty. And the worse it gets, my God, why am I, what's happening to me? You become even more enthralled with it, right? You know, um, what, uh, uh, you know, so that's happening with the minister, but how does it flame up from there? Sure, well, you know, and this is why sometimes we, I often, often describe in Witcher After Stories, often describe it as an outbreak because it is, frankly, it, it's, it's like a virus. It's like a disease. It spreads. Right. And this is what happens in Salem. And first it's it's victims are just a few girls. And then it ends up with being 15, 20 girls and young women and a couple of men. And again, then the neighbors are sort of saying like, well, my cow got sick. And I think here, it happened there too. Here's the thing. Witchcraft is always there. Right. Just like all of us, our societies, sometimes I equate it to terrorism. And I don't mean to to, you know, make a direct relationship there. But if you think about it, Terrorism is always a threat. It's always there. Witches were real. They were always at work or the fear was real in the 1600s. But at times of stress and tension in a society, that's when the accusations start to fly, right? You always have your concerns about that neighbor who acts a little strangely, who, who worships God perhaps differently than you do, who maybe, maybe speaks with an accent because we never can be sure who the witches are, right? Just like we can't be sure who the terrorists are. But, and you know what? Frankly, here in York, Maine, I don't think they're here. But you know what? When I went to visit my daughter in Manhattan, I was a little more on guard. And, and you know, when the siren goes off, you just say, gosh, I hope no one's hurt by that accident. But then if you hear an explosion, at some point you go to that really bad place, right? And that's what happens in 1692. As more people begin to have signs of, of the presence of Satan, more people think that the things that are going on around them might be caused by Satan and by witchcraft. So it grows. And within, in, in Salem, within a couple of months, you have 50, 100 people accused. And over the course of a summer, you have, again, at least 170 people accused of being witches um, because the fear and the panic grows. Now and you, you can't deny you're a witch because that's what a witch would do, right? Exactly, right. That's absolutely the problem. And here's what's even worse. So wait a second, if, you're witch, if your wife is accused of witchcraft, you of course want to defend her, but, or your neighbor. But then people begin to say, well, now wait a second, why would, why would they defend a witch? I'm beginning to wonder about them, right? So this is how the panic and the fear grows. And in Salem, part of the way it grows is when the judges do get involved and they start bringing in people, they treat it must, much like you know, a modern day crime drama where you bring in, you know, the, the perp and, hey, come on, we got the evidence that you're a witch. Now, come on, fess up, 
and things might go a little easier on you than they could be. Um, okay, tell us who are the other witches, right? And by the way, in the 17th century, it was okay to use what they considered mild or judicial torture. And I think it was a bit like, you know, we might think waterboarding today is mild or judicial torture, right? But we know John Proctor describes, uh, who was one of the fellows who was executed, he describes a couple weeks before his death, his son and some other boys who were like teenagers, 10, 12, 14 years old, being tortured, being tied neck and heels, where they literally take a rope or a chain or a, be a belt and they tie your neck to your heels mm -hmm. and then they hold you upside down by your belt until the blood starts gushing out of your nose. And that won't kill you, but at the time you think it might. And all of a sudden, you may be a little more willing to say, so maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was a witch and didn't realize it. Right? Right. What, do you, where do you, what do you want me to sign and where? And that's how it grows because even and then when you confess, come on, okay, covens meet. We know they're led by Satan. Who was in your coven? And the first woman to conf confess, the Paris's slave, Tituba. She, when she confesses, they say, okay, who was at the meeting? Um, I don't know. There was a bunch of people there. It was dark. It was night. There was a tall guy. He was wearing a hat. It was kind of dark. I couldn't quite see his face. He said he was from Boston. I didn't catch his name. Right? No, no, no. Names. We need names, right? I mean, it's just like I, my wife and I like to watch reruns of The Closer, you know, the TV show where it's all around this like, you know, maybe using even a little trickery or skirting the edge of legality because we know that they're guilty and we've got to get that confession in writing. And once we flip you, we'll get Mr. or Mrs. Big, right? That's what this was all about. And frankly, too, that's kind of how it grew. And it gets to the point pretty soon where anybody, even good God-fearing Puritan men and women who regularly attend church can be accused. And finally, it gets to the point where the governor's wife is accused of being a witch. And at that point, he says, okay, time out. And does that dispel it? at that point? Well, it, it, it sort of dispels it, but it takes them, at that point, this is the fall of 1692. The first accusations are in January. Uh, the first, uh, first pretrial hearings are like in March and April. By June, there's over 100 people in jail and it keeps going. Finally, in October, the governor says, we're closing down the witchcraft court, but there still are well over 100 people in jail. Um, and it takes them literally another like six months to empty the jails, but they one important rule with the new trials, you can't use spectral evidence. You can only go back to the old standards of evidence, which are pretty tough because to convict someone of witchcraft, you have to either have their signed confession. And again, if you're not torturing people, that's hard to get. Or the sworn legal testimony of two eyewitnesses who saw you commit a black act of black magic. Now, since I hope we can all agree that black magic wasn't real then or now, right? The people already in league with Satan to harm people. It was kind of hard to get witnesses to this. So if you, if you can't have witnesses, if you've thrown out spectral evidence, if people who have even confessed under duress now say, wait, you know, my husband said that was a good idea that it might save my life, but it, I really am not a witch, no. Um, that's when it all kind of gradually, gradually uh, played out. And it, but it took, from start to finish about a year and a half from the last people to leave jail. And unfortunately, the last woman who died, died in prison after the, she'd been um, found not guilty. But you'll love this, in the 17th century, um, you had, to, if you were in jail, you had to basically pay for your jail fees to provide you with room and board. Isn't that lovely? And, and she had been declared not guilty, but her family had not yet come up with the money to pay the jailer to free her. And, and sadly, she, she passed away before she could uh, leave jail. So, yeah. You know, the, the minister's daughters, were they, did they, were they executed or did they end up being okay? No, because see, they were, they were, they were afflicted and they accused people of witchcraft, but they were never actually accused of being witches, right? But yeah. it's a fine line because are you afflicted or are you showing, you know, showing signs of being a witch yourself? And there were, there was at least one woman who sort of uh, originally started being afflicted and then um, eventually was accused of witchcraft uh, and was able to sort of escape those charges. So what's interesting is that the ministers girls who start this, uh, they kind of disappear early on. Um, and within about a month or so, they're no longer the center of attention. But there is this larger group of 10 or 12 girls, mostly 
18, 19, 20, who are kind of the key accusers. And there's some interesting features about them. Some of, a lot of them are war refugees. There was a major war going on up here where I live in Maine between the Native Americans uh, and their French allies and the English. And um, there'd been a lot of people displaced by the war. There was a panic and fear that the whole, all of New England was going to be destroyed. Many of these girls were, 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 were orphans or had lost a father fighting, um, were now lowly household servants working for masters. Um, so they left tough lives. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the men they accused, their masters that they accused of being, of being witches, they accused the master specter of beating them. Mm. Uh, Giles, Giles Corey uh, and George Jacobs, men like this who are you know, kind of middle-class kind of guys, farmers, um, and uh, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll say, well, his, his specter took his cane and beat me repeatedly, right? And I, again, I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility that some of these girls were suffering emotional, verbal, maybe physical abuse from their mm -hmm. masters. And this was perhaps the only tool that they had to try to, you know, protect themselves and get and get back at them. Now, you you found the actual place where these executions uh, took place. Now, how did you how did you identify it? Sure. Well, let me let me correct that, and I'll say, you know, it's really funny because it, it was called that year in like 2017 one of the ten most important finds in in archaeology by Archaeology Magazine, but. I like to point out we didn't discover anything. What we did was, was confirm a site that people in Salem had showed collective amnesia towards for more than 300 years, but even then had not been lost. And there had been uh, research done by a man uh, named Sidney Purley in the early 20th century. He published a couple of articles sort of saying like, hey, we know where the executions took place. And it was right here on this lower part of Gallows Hill called Proctor's Ledge. And so, what our job was, the team that I was on, the, the Gallows Hill team, were asked, could we look at the evidence, the documents, the written record, any physical evidence, and see if we could figure out if this was the execution site. Um, long story really short, we were able to use the documents. There aren't many, uh, there aren't many eyewitness accounts, ironically. We have almost 1,000 records that survive from 1692, but almost none of them speak to the executions. But we were able to piece together the evidence use uh, uh, some geo-information science, GIS, uh, to, to do some uh, mapping and things uh, and, and, and determine pretty much where the location was within probably 50 or 100 feet. And also to, uh, to do some archeological work because I'm also an archeologist, uh, to do remote sensing, ground penetrating radar to say, we don't fit, sign and find any evidence of the gallows here or, or also of any graves. Um, Proctor's ledge is, is it's called the ledge because there's no soil, but we can be about 90, 95% certain that this is where the execution site took place. It fits with the historical record, with the, the modern science, and, and also too with the oral history because there were traditions in several families as to where the executions took place. And so we were finally able to go public with that information back in, in, in 2017 and to, um, and, and to sort of make sure that that place is not forgotten. That was our real job, was not to discover the site, but to make sure that there was a memorial there so that no one would, as we say, as I say, could never, ever, ever forget this again. Because, you know, um, if you forget the site, you begin to forget the horror and the injustice that took place to these victims. Now, now we, we do forget it though. We, we make it into Halloween and we make it into a carnival and we make it into all these other things. So, so you know, and, and we have Emmett Till after that, and we have all sorts of things that take place in American history after that. So, so you know, how do we keep it alive? And, and I mean, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, so I, first off, I'll say in general that every generation has its Salem witch trials, right? And, and again, I think most people are very much are familiar with, with the Crucible as being sort of like, you know, the, the, uh, Arthur Miller's wonderful play. It's a wonderful play. It's it's not great as history, but the point is, you know, it, it is the same sort of idea of, of scapegoating, of, of a, of a po population under stress, in panic, they're scared. Who do we blame for our ills, right? And each generation in American history has this, and they, interesting, re related to the Salem witch trials. For example, um, the inoculation crisis in Boston in the 1720s, when they're trying to come up with a vaccine 
for, for smallpox, uh, the first successful vaccination, where uh, some people who are complaining about these efforts actually relate it back to witchcraft and to the fanaticism of the day. During the American Revolution, people are accusing the patriots of being uh, the Tories, you know, the loyalists are accusing the patriots of being fanatics, just like their ancestors in Salem. Uh, you know, during, during the 19th century, uh, when, when New Englanders were, were famous for their efforts to abolish slavery, Southerners are accusing New Englanders of being fanatics in trying to stop slavery, you know, just like their ancestors used to burn witches. And we all know New Englanders never burned witches. They were much more civilized. They hanged them, right? Um, but anyhow, so the point is each generation has its Salem. Um, but it's clear too that it, it's Salem, as you point out, has become this sin, word that's synonymous, right? With rushing to judgment, with infamy, uh, mm -hmm. with injustice, with extremism, fanaticism, right? Um, and in that sense, Salem has really, Gallows Hill has really cast, as I say, a long shadow um, over Salem. The good news is I think in Salem is, uh, and again, you think about this, this creates a lot of shame from day one or day two, right? We know that the first efforts to publicly humiliate Salem by an author is in an English book in 1697, right? So this is, and, and it was people in, in, in Salem were so shameful, so remorseful, that it took over, it took 300 years until, the, until 1992 to build a memorial. So there's always been that, 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 that sense, but also too, increasingly, on this, um, since 1892, the bicentennial when they started selling souvenirs and they started labeling things as, you know, buy which city codfish cakes and which city soap, it became commercialized. It's been commercialized. And the problem we face today, this goes back to the 1970s when um, all really kind of started when, when Bip, remember when we were kids, the TV series Bewitched? Yeah. Sure. Well, in 1970, Bewitched, their studio uh, in Hollywood burnt down. And so they had to go on the road for most of that season. So they said, hey, let's go to Salem for the season and shoot there. So uh, Samantha and Darren and the family all go to Salem. And, you know, it becomes famous for the witches convention. And within a year or so, we have really kind of our first modern, modern day Wiccan in Salem. Uh, and there is no tie at all between modern day Wiccans and, and witches in the 17th century. Um, modern day Wiccans is a wonderful faith. They're, they're, they're wonderful people. Um, they're, they're not in league with Satan, please. But anyhow, my point is, from that point forward, Salem it became sort of a mecca for, for Wiccans and also for witches and, and, and also gets conflated with Halloween, right? And we have this Halloween festival, haunted happenings that lasts, good grief, a month. We have maybe half a million tourists to Salem in that month. It's big business. We were a post-industrial city now. We have a wonderful university that I'm proud to work for. Um, and we have other cool things going for Salem, great history. But increasingly, people want to come to Salem to learn about witchcraft, right? And so on the one hand, people are ashamed and want to um, honor the memory of those victims. We have a whole organization called Voices Against Injustice, which gives an annual award every year in honor of the victims in 1692. It's a social justice award. But on the other hand, people make a living uh, talking about those victims. And frankly, sometimes telling ghost stories and other fun, fa fantastic stuff related with that, right? Um, so it's a balancing act. And I think the good news is to me, to tie it back into the, the, the confirmation of the execution site, I like to think that uh, that the confirmation of the execution site is, a, is an important step in the direction. You know, when we scholars found this and first met with the, 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 the mayor of Salem, a wonderful woman, Ken, Kim Driscoll, I was afraid of what her reaction would be. It's like, oh no, just what we need, right? No, absolutely not. She and I, because I'm thinking like, we, we have to do something, we have to memorialize this. We're a bunch of poor historians. How are we gonna raise the money to do a memorial and all this? And, and Kim's going like, nope, you don't need to worry. The city of Salem must do this. This is important work that we do. And to me, this is all part of the healing process. And, um, you know, I, I, I actually, I was one of the people who spoke at the dedication. And I said, you know, this is an important turning point, right? This is Salem owning being which city and that being kind of our own scarlet letter, right? And from this day forward, we need, you know, more sort of commemoration and reflection on the horrible events of 1692. 
and the fact that today Salem is a city that's incredibly forgiving. We welcome everybody. We don't judge, right? Because we know what happens when you do. So we need a little bit more of that and a little bit less of the kind of like celebration or what I call the, the uh, fried dough and vampire fang syndrome because this is really isn't something to celebrate. And you know what? I enjoy a good parade and a good piece of fried dough as much as the next person. And I love bringing my daughters to Salem when they were younger for Halloween where we have about 100,000 people take to the streets. I think it's as close to Mardi Gras as you can probably get in New England. But you know, this is an opportunity for us to really be reflective about what's happening. And I think uh, I, I'm optimistic for the future, Jesse, I really am. You know, what's, the relevant, you... what's irrelevant, any, anything happening right now where you could say, cause you do keep tying it to the present, but we haven't come all the way up to 2021. Are there things, cautionary moments here for us to think about? Well, one is too, I mean, I think it's really cool is I, I think, you know, maybe one, I think one reason you first heard about the story was the, the, the museum in Salem, the Peabody Essex Museum, which is a world-class, world-famous museum of, of, of art and, and culture and, and, and uh, you name it. Um, they have the best collection of materials related to the Salem Witch Trials. And right now, in, until April, they've got it for, for the first time since 1992, the tercentenary, they're having a major exhibit uh, on the witch trials where you can go see that, that cane that, that one of the men used supposedly, his specter used to, to, to beat his victims. And so it's a great opportunity to learn more about the study. Unfortunately, I know it's tough to make it to Salem these days. So that's, that's to me, is one of the exciting things is to have the community come together um, with this exhibit. But I mean, we, we can talk about mod the modern day parallels all you want, but I also don't want to get too, too political on this, Priscilla. <laughs> so yeah. I'll leave it. You, you I'll know, let you, you but feel, feel free to ask away. You know, do you, um... Uh, are any of the families, the descendants, you know, in Faulkner, the, the people are always, you know, they never leave. The families are, you know, there, for, you know, there's no, it's always past, the present's always in the future, you know, it's all together. Are any of those families still in Salem? Have you ever met any of the people, the relatives? Yes, omnipresent. And if you think about it, uh, the people who were involved in the witch trials, 19 victims, 170 accused, another couple hundred accusers. I mean, I like to point out, I think there are literally millions of descendants of people who were involved in the trials. And the families of the victims are, are a strong and vocal group. It's, um, it's a rare time I don't give a public lecture that I don't have descendants of victims. And if you go to the memorial, there's an, a, a, a memorial that was created in 1992 in downtown Salem. And there is a simple, solemn place with granite benches for each of the victims. Um, you will regularly see objects of remembrance uh, on those benches, um, coins, roses, crystals, um, notes from descendants. You'll go there and uh, I saw a, a note on Giles Corey's bench um, who was, was sadly pressed to death um, for, uh, in, in the trials. And it's a letter from like a 10th great granddaughter to him where she says, we have not forgotten you. We love you. We honor your memory. We want you to know that we are here. And you know, honestly, when one of the really neat things that happened uh, when the when we announced the the, the find on on Proctor's Ledge, uh, it became a it became a new story. I my Wednesday of that week, my 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 daughter texted me and said, "Hey, Dad, you and Gallo Hill are trending on Facebook." And we're like, "Good God, <laughs> I, I, I didn't didn't get into this business for this." But anyhow, but it's an opportunity to, to tell the story. But also too, it was an opportunity for the um, for the, for the victims' families to to reach out, and I had a like about a three minute spot on Fox News, and within a couple hours, my my voicemail box was it was overly full with testimonial. Thank you so much for what you and the city are doing. I'm the tenth great granddaughter of Rebecca Nurse. My family and I have always wondered, and this is unfinished business to us, and we can't thank you enough for what you've done. Let us know when you dedicate the memorial. I'm coming from. Arizona, England, California, Canada, you name it. We want to be there. This is important to us. Um, you know, is there, when you walk the ground, is there a feeling when you walk the ground where you know where these events took place? Is there something residual there? So, you know, I, I live in York, Maine, but I commute to Salem, Massachusetts. Not quite so much these days. But I, I try to come in when I go in, I go in almost every day by these landmarks. 
by Salem Village where the accusations take place. Maybe I'll take a spin by Gallows Hill. On special days, on days of executions, I and others like, like to visit the memorial or to visit Proctor's Ledge because it does have that very real connection to me. And I honestly, um, uh, I guess I'm, I think I'm incredibly privileged and lucky to be at Salem State University to be in Salem. Uh, but I also, too, to me, I would find it really hard to write about this stuff if I, if I wasn't in regularly in contact with the place because, you know, without getting too spiritual here, it, 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 it is evocative and it really does speak to me. And uh, of course, my wife would accuse me of living too much in the 17th century than the 21st, you know. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing this with us. Really, really appreciate it. This is a you know, wonderful thing to talk about, Emerson. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it's wonderful, but it's also awful, isn't it? And I, yeah. I like to say this, I do think it's ultimately wonderful because I, I, I really uh, take great encouragement uh, that, that folks like you are interested in hearing the story and, and hearing you know, the possible lessons and its relevance. So thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining me.